Father, we just thank you so much for everything you do for us. Lord, we thank you for the lesson this morning. Lord, we, Lord, we do pray for revival, Father. We just ask that you help us all to, uh, to look to you and, Lord, to humble, uh, humble ourselves, Father, and uh, pray to you for revival, Father. We thank you for this church. We thank you for each one that's here. Lord, we just thank you for Waylon as he brings our uh, song service, Father. Lord, just prepare our hearts, Father. Thank you, Brother Mike. We just lift him up to you this morning, Lord, and just ask that you, Lord, just give him what he needs to lead our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Daniel, if you would, give us those pictures. I want to give you an update on our work over in Africa where we're building the school and let you see the progress on the school. We have sent them $10,000 to this point, and they said about $15,000. Uh, price of stuff has gone up over there, but we're shooting for $20,000, so there's enough money to put uh, tables and chairs in there. So anytime you have a few extra dollars and you want to give it for a good purpose, uh, we're still about $10,000 away from getting finished with that school in Zambia. And so if you want to help with that, there's, uh, as you see, great progress being made. And uh, also, we're still collecting toward our uh, awning that we're going to build out front. Uh, we have reached about $14,000 so far in the building fund. When that gets up to $25,000, we're going to go ahead and start that project. So uh, these are just areas where God may move on your heart to give and be a part of something. And then don't forget, right after church today, our youth fundraiser, they're trying to redo the playground. We did some work on the playground yesterday. Children's but playground. Children's playground, what did I say? Oh, did I say the youth playground? This whole campus is a youth playground, we have learned. It's just a whole, whole campus. So uh, anyway, but no, the children's playground uh, today, there'll be a pulled pork lunch, uh, pulled pork sandwiches, uh, plates are available after church this morning over in the fellowship hall. I hope you'll stay. Uh, recommended donation to that's ten dollars, but we will accept twenties at the same time. And I was told to tell Joe this morning that the Saints play tomorrow night, so you can stay and eat today, Joe. All right, so <laughs> we'll make sure you knew that. I just want to make sure you had that understanding. And then don't forget, there's a security training. If you'd like to be on the security team here at the church. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can get more information from uh, Brother Odie. Uh, he's out, outside, I think, or, or one of those guys back there. Uh, Brother Mike Turner or from Daryl, if he's here today. But anyway, if you'd like to get signed, it's free. And uh, it's at the Sheriff's Training Academy over on, uh, uh, what's the name of that road? Richard Fuel, Sheriff Richard Fuel Road there in West Monroe where they have the, the shooting range and stuff. So that's where it'll be taught. And then don't forget, homecoming is coming up on October the 1st. October the 1st. And do you know what? This will be either our, we're trying to figure out the start date. It's either our 39th or our 40th uh, homecoming anniversary uh, annual meeting. So it may be a 40-year uh, mark that we would want to really celebrate. We're not sure. I told Brother Ray we have talking about this morning whether we started in 83 or 84. Sir? We'll know tomorrow, he said. And so we'll let you know about that next week. But that's October the 1st, and our associational missionary will be here, Brother Stephen Kelly. He's going to be bringing a message for us that morning. And so we're looking forward to, to that day. Have lunch, dinner on the ground. We'll give you more details about that next Sunday. And then that Monday night after that. And we don't have church on Sunday night when we have homecoming. So we're going to bring you back on Monday night to make up for it, okay? We need to get that comp time in there. So, uh, But on Monday night, you won't want to miss uh, Dr. Richard Blackaby. He's going to be with us. Most of you know his dad, Henry Blackaby, but Richard wrote a lot of the Experiencing God booklets and workbooks with, uh, with Henry Blackaby. Uh, very seldom will you get the opportunity to hear somebody like Henry Blackaby speak. Now, he is the keynote speaker that week at the Senior Adult Progressive Revival here in the association. So if you go to that during the day, you'll get to hear him. But he'll be with us that night. He's going to speak to all of our teachers. 
and our leadership council at five o'clock at a dinner here at the church and then speak to all of our churches. We've invited all the area to come to hear him that night on Monday night at 630. So I hope that you'll be able to come and plan to be here. You really don't want to miss this opportunity. He is the chancellor for the Southern Baptist Seminary up in Canada uh, right now. And so keep him in your prayers as he prepares to speak to us that night. Okay. Anything else that I missed of importance? By the way, all right, let's stand together. We are here to bless and lift up the name of Jesus. Let's do that. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of our God.
This is the condition, the why, the question mark over each of our lives. If, if 
I. If I am good enough, if I don't mess up too much, if I go to the right church, if I prove to God my worth, if I pray before I eat, if I read scripture before I sleep, if I do enough good works, if I share the gospel with those who search, if I always give it my best try, if I do the most I can before I die, if, 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 I. Now the problem with these questioning lines is not actually that you're asking if, but that your if is dependent upon your I. Because if you're trying to provide yourself with an equation that assures you of your salvation, and you're trying to use yourself as the standard, the cause, the determinant, the foundation, then all you will ever get out of your internal interrogations to the question, have I finally done enough to receive salvation, will be a resounding negative declaration no, no, you aren't good enough. No, you messed up too much. No, you did not do enough good works. No, you did not prove to God your worth. No, you didn't give it your best try. No, you didn't do enough before you died. If your if is based on your I, then your assurance of salvation will always be denied. And yet, for every single one of us, this is what we've tried to base our salvation on self-evaluation. But all we ever get out of this arrangement is condemnation. That's why you feel lacking, no matter how hard you try, because your if is based on your I. It's why you feel disobedient no matter how often you comply because your if is based on your I. It's why you feel distant like a misfit, like a second class citizen. It's why you feel empty no matter how much you supply because your if is based on your I and your I can never measure up to the standard of God on high and that's not because his standards are awry but it's because he is perfect and we always fall short of that prize and so there is always condemnation for those who are in I. But there is good news. There is gospel free to all without price. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So let's make a new condition. Let's Let's ask a different why. With the old one gone, let's fly a freshly drawn question mark over each of our lives. Let's ask a new if to replace our if eyes. Let's ask if, if Christ, if Christ was good enough. If Christ loved so much, if Christ died to save his church, if Christ rose to give us his worth, if Christ provided bread of life to eat, if Christ fulfilled the scriptures by crushing death beneath his feet, if Christ performed every good work, sought out those who never searched, died the death we should have died, beat the grave to raise us to life, if, 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 Christ. Now, the joy within these questioning lines is that our if is no longer dependent on something that we supplied. Instead, the if of our salvation is dependent on the one who loved us so much that he was crucified. So, let's abandon our if eyes and run towards if christ let's move from feeling like i'm condemned to say i'm convinced that neither life nor death neither heights nor depths not my own faults or mess ups not my guilt or distrust nothing can separate me from the love of god because all my ifs christ answered on the cross and so, we can ask one final if, and with it, all condemnation is crushed. 
if God is for us, who can be against us?
Let's let the little ones go out for children's church at this time. Don't run over anybody. All right. We got a lot of folks gone on trips and vacations this weekend. There's James here. All dressed up this morning. So good to see all of you this morning. Today I want to talk to you about a subject called contentment. Contentment. Now contentment can be something that is very good because we're contented. In fact, the Bible says, and we'll look at the verse this morning out of Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. And it says to us that godliness with contentment is great gain. Now what does it mean by contentment? It means someone that's full and someone that is satisfied 
with God. And they're satisfied with what God has given them. And they're satisfied. It's kind of like the video. I like that guy doing that video this morning. I got to get me one of them knit hats. I got to preach in one of them on Sunday and wear a t-shirt and knit hat and stuff like that. But that dude had a good message for us about how to be full and content in our relationship with Christ. And not always measuring ourselves and our goodness and our works by trying to see if we're good enough. But we're going to talk about what contentment is not this morning. I'll tell you what it's not. Contentment's not being casual about your faith. Sometimes we like to spiritualize our contentment. Charles Stanley had a book come out years ago, and it was called Confronting Casual Christianity. And that's where a lot of us are sometimes. We're just kind of casual about our faith. We just kind of, well, if we take it or leave it. You know, just kind of, I'm glad I got it, but I don't really use it a whole lot. I'm just glad to have it. Glad I got my ticket punched to heaven, and I'm going to make it one day. And, and I'm not going to be standing on the promises. I'm just going to be sitting on the premises. But, uh, but that's all I'm going to do, and I'm going to be real casual about my faith. That's not what the Bible means by contentment. Okay? The Bible doesn't mean by contentment that you refuse to, let's say, get a job and be a provider for your family. Well, I'm just contented with whatever God gives me. Get off of your tail and get a job. Amen? That's not what it means by contentment. It don't mean just be satisfied with less than nothing. Well, I'm just going to let the government take care of me and be content. No, you're lazy. You're not content. Hello? The Bible says you don't provide for your family no better than an infidel. What divide, contentment does not mean, it does not mean also that we, that we are excusing our sin in our life. Well, I know I'm sinning in this area, and, and I'm just kind of going to, well, I'm just content in that. I, I'm just going to be content at where I am. No, the Bible says don't be content in your sin. That's not what it means by contentment. Contentment means I'm full of joy. I'm fully satisfied in God. And I am proud of God, and I hope that God is proud of me. And we are in a close relationship. I'm walking in obedience to God. And so it doesn't mean just saying that, well, everybody does it. Well, it's okay if I sin in this area, that area. Everybody does it. Sometimes we get confused by those meanings and, uh, you know, and we think that, that, that God doesn't really care because God has saved us and we're under grace and God just doesn't care about my sin. He's, he's okay with that. No, He's not. He wants you to repent. And there's nothing wrong with some Holy Spirit conviction about that guilt in our lives. Sometimes we ought to be guilty. Now, that's the difference in guilt and condemnation. Boy, anybody that's in Christ is not under condemnation. Condemnation's hell, right? Judgment to hell. But yet, sometimes in our life, we need some daily Holy Spirit conviction in our life. Do you hear me? When, the, when God the Holy Spirit says, hey, you drifted away from me today, repent of that. Come on back. Come on back. I'm looking for you to come home and get right with God. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Some people today want to paint that off as, well, that's a bad thing. That's not guilt. Guilt's not a good thing. Well, guilt says to us, turn around. Guilt says to us, you've been disobedient. Don't be contented about your guilt in your life. See that as a positive thing of God reminding us, just like a parent would remind a child that they've missed, they've been disobedient about something in their life. And then one other thing contentment is not, and then I'm going to start preaching. Contentment is not a reason to do less than your best in church attendance. Well, I'm just contented with once a week. I'm just trying to be spiritually content. Well, contentment is not saying, well, uh, you know, I don't give anything to the church, but I'm just contented in that. I'm contented in my disobedience. God doesn't want you to be contented with disobedience. That's not what it means. In fact, the Bible says that whatever you do, 
whether it's to eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In other words, give it your very best. Give it your very best. Man, I think we ought to give God the best we have, don't you? The best effort, the best energy, the best faithfulness. Man, I just want to be... I don't, want to, I don't want my contentment. So when I talk about contentment this morning, I want to make sure you understand what it's not. And now we're going to talk about what it is. Okay? And what is spiritual contentment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. If you fill up to it this morning, if you don't, that's fine, perfectly fine. I want to stand with me as I read these scriptures. Verses 6 through 12. Listen to what it says. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. I'll tell you what I forgot to put up this week was a picture of a... I was going to put up there a picture, brother, uh, of a a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer to the cemetery. Probably had trouble finding one, right? I forgot to look, but I'd probably... Because the Bible says you can't take it with you. Amen? You're going to leave it behind. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Well, (laughs) my truck's 20 years old, God. You don't expect me to be content with that. My house is 50 years old, Lord. You don't expect me to be content with that. They got some of them new fancy tennis shoes that cost $200 a pair. You don't expect me to send my kids to school without them kind of tennis shoes, do you, preacher? Surely we don't need that kind of contentment. God says we can do with a lot less when we've got the right mindset on what's important in life. Verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all. Sometimes people say money is the root of all evil. No, it says the love of money, the worship of money, greed, materialism, it's talking about is the root of all kinds of evil, in which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, Paul says to Timothy, and pursue righteousness. Do you think this was just a word for Timothy, not everybody else? Hello? Do you think these things about contentment are just for Timothy? Just for preachers, Timothy was to be a pastor. This is a pastor's epistle. It's not just for pastors. It's for all of us. It's principles for life of of what motivates you and what doesn't motivate you. And he says, pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Obviously, he's talking to Timothy about how to live his life, but these are principles that follow all of us, life principles about what's important in our priorities. Let's pray. Fathers, we read these scriptures, we are reminded of the how we battle against... Uh, materialism and how we battle against greed and how we always want to impress others with what we have and and God how that you've called us to have got a, a right heart and a right spirit about the things that you've placed in our life that they're really not even ours and it's not something we can just hang on to and you've also told us Lord that they're they, the only things that we really hold on to eternity are the things that we send on ahead and store up in heaven. Not the things that we store up on earth. Remind us of that today, Lord, as we live in a very, very, very materialistic world. How to be different from the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now let me say, first of all, as a preface before I go any further, that there's nothing wrong with having money. Some folks are always going to have more than others because God's blessed them that way. And you know who God usually blesses? A lot of times God blesses people who don't see it, who don't store up their treasures, but they see themselves as a channel of blessings. They see themselves as God using them to pass wealth through them to others and to giving. You'll find many times they're good givers. They're not just good receivers. And yet we know people that are, have chosen the wicked lifestyle, have chosen to not follow God, who seem to be overrun with wealth. <laughs> you know, the, the psalmist wrote about that. Why do the evil seem to flourish? Why do they seem to prosper, he says. And the psalmist is answered by God, and God says to the psalmist, he says, Oh, but if they just knew their future. They are on a slippery slope. In other words, there's coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day when they're going to give account for what they did with all the things that God allowed in their life. They're going to think about the choices that they made and whether or not they followed God or whether or not they followed their own desire. And he says, they stand on a slippery slope. In other words, one day their feet's going to come out from under them and they're going to fall. We understand that from Scripture today. Now let's talk about what contentment is. First thing, the importance of contentment. We see it there in verse 6. And by the way, I hope you bring your Bibles to church. I hope you bring your Bibles because I want you to know that when I preach something, it's coming right out of the Word of God. I don't want to just tell you it's in verse 6. I want you to read it in verse 6. And then I want you to make notes on it. And I, someone once said that a dirty Bible leads to a clean heart. You know, one of the things you can do is make some notes in your Bible and or on the sheet that I give you, a worksheet I give you. But make some notes and follow along in Scripture because guess what? I want these things to pass just like wealth. I want it to pass to you. And then you pass it on to others. I want you to be able to give it to your children and your grandchildren and your neighbors and your friends. And hopefully some of these things will be things that I've known people through the years that save up sermon notes. And and they almost have their own little theological library with filing cabinets with uh, sermon notes in there that they've collected over the years. And so the importance of contentment is here in verse 6. And first of all, two things about it. It's a sign of godliness. He says there, godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh, it's a, it's a partnership with godliness is contentment. And it means that I'm at peace and full of joy with whatever God gives me. Now, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is called grumbling, dissatisfaction, or A big Bible term, listen now, murmuring. The Bible says there were some folks didn't get to go into the promised land because they murmured against God. They grumbled. They were dissatisfied. Think about it. Think about it for after they refused to cross over the River Jordan and go into the promised land, God said, okay, all of you older folks who are smart enough to know better than that, you're going to wander in this wilderness for 40 years. I'm not going to allow you to go into the promised land, and you're going to die in this wilderness Guess what? Some of them murmured for 40 years. And God didn't let them into that promised land. They complained. They murmured. They griped. They argued. They were dissatisfied. Instead, God could have said to them, I will, not only am I not going to let you in the promised land, I'm not going to let you into heaven. We know God doesn't work that way, but they, the, hopefully they had heaven ahead of them. And, and they had something to look forward to and something to be happy about, not knowing when they would die, but not knowing where they were headed. But the point I'm making to you is that dissatisfaction, murmuring, complaining about God is you accusing God of child neglect. When you say, God, I don't have enough of this, or I don't have enough of that, or I don't have a new enough of this, or I want more of this, or what you're saying is, God, you're not doing a very good job as a parent. You ever think about it that way? God, I'm really dissatisfied with your parenthood in my life. That's a pretty bold statement. huh? Look out, there may be a lightning bolt coming through the ceiling to pop you in top of the head. 
And that's what murmuring and complaining is. That's what dissatisfaction is. That's what a life of discontentment is. Someone who doesn't like the way God does things. And so we look at that today. A second thing I want you to see is in, it separates us from, from those who are filled with greed. Contentment separates us from greed. Look at that. How important it is that we understand that, that God does not create in us a greedy heart. The only thing we ought to be greedy for is more souls to get saved. The only thing we ought to be greedy for is to see more people get right with God. We ought to be greedy. If we're going to be greedy for something, be greedy for spiritual things, not secular things like money. And so that's what separates us from the world. The world is still greedy for what will make it better for me. And you see, the one who's contented even thinks about what will make it better for you. Think about that. The person who's content says, I'm not concerned about me. I want to know how I can help you. What a sweet spirit that is. You know, there's a, I've seen every name of a Baptist church. I've seen Toad Suck Baptist Church. I've seen Last Chance Baptist Church. I've seen Number 5 Baptist Church. I've seen everything you could possibly imagine uh, named a Baptist church. But I've never seen one name contented Baptist Church. I've never seen that on a church sign. I wonder why. Maybe because we're not known for our contentment. I don't know. Number two, I want you to see the insignificance of costly possessions. The insignificance of costly possessions. Verse 7 talks about it when he says we brought nothing into this world. Certainly we can carry nothing out. And you can spend all of your life trying to gain things. There's nothing wrong with having a collection. You know, so if you come to my house and you go in the back room and you see my plates, my gold trim plates, Franklin Mint plates of John Wayne movies, don't think I'm greedy. Nothing wrong with having a little, con little uh, collection of John Wayne materials. Pastor's confessing his faults right here in front of the whole church. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. I only got about 10 or 12, so I don't have that many. But I think about that, and I think about how many times we may put off doing what's right with God because we're trying to get this for ourselves. We're trying to add this to our collection, or we want a little more of this, or we want a little more of that. I, I, I've had people come to me before and say, Pastor, I can't afford to tithe. Man, they went up on my, golf, my country club dues this year, I bought a new truck. I, I, I've just not been able to really... To just do what God wants me to do because my bills, I'm just, I just, I don't make enough. And I said, well, bless your little heart. Why don't you give God as much thought as them golf clubs? Why don't you give God as much thought of whether or not your, you know, your three-year-old truck wasn't good enough. You had to have a new one. You know, we get that way in our life when we, all we can think about is comfort for ourselves. Or getting ahead of the Joneses maybe. You know, maybe we're just trying to get ahead of somebody else and have more than they have. And that's not the important thing in life, is it? If you knew that you could have great wealth, but yet you were going to be miserable, as many people are. And they'll tell you, people, some of the wealthiest people in the world are the saddest people in the world. They may have the things of material possession, but they don't have the joy of God. They don't have a fulfillment in their life. And friends, I want you to know that's what happens in our life. If you knew that you could have all that wealth, but yet you were going to be miserable, would you swap for that? Would you swap that to get a little bit more in this life? Two things about the insignificance of those costly possessions. God places value on eternal things. If you and I, would you agree with me that we're supposed to try to be more like God? Hello? Hello? Aren't we supposed to be being conformed into the image of Christ? That's what God's doing. The Father is conforming us into the image of His Son. And what that means is that He's shaping us to like the things that Jesus likes. And, and, and one of the things that Jesus did was He said, I am surrendered to the will of the Father. Not to, even to His own will, you know. He, there in the garden before the crucifixion, He said, Oh, if this could pass from me, but not my will be done, but thy will be done. And that ought to be our heart. 
That ought to be our desire. Is that God put my need on the back burner and God put your eternal kingdom needs on the front burner. God help me to think like that. That's what we've been studying the last few Sunday nights on Sunday nights about uh, that having that kingdom or that biblical worldview or mindset, trying to think the way God wants us to think about things. A second thing under number two, gold holds very little value in eternity. God places great value on eternal things, but gold, the things of this world, how many people have died to try to have a little more gold in this world? Uh, y'all have heard me say it before, but you know, gold's important here, but they just paved the streets with it in heaven. It doesn't have any value at all. Isn't it amazing how our thinking is either earthly or it's eternal? It's one of the two. And our thinking must be eternity things. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, this, Those who serve mammon will store up treasures on earth. And basically those who serve God, they're going to store up treasures in eternity. And he says you can't serve both God and mammon. The God of money. The God of wealth. And so he says to us, he challenges us that, that those two don't run in the same lane. They're running different lanes. And we have to get in the right lane. Number three in your outline. The instructions on how to be content. In verse 8. It says, And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, verses. I may read them and say, well, that's pretty gray right there. That's kind of tough. I need to study some other verses and understand the meaning of that. But, but when I read verse 8 right here, it's pretty clear, isn't it? God says, I, I put clothes on your back. And I'm putting food in your stomach. And in our day, we would probably look at a third thing. Now, you know, we would probably say, well, you gave me a place to live. Anybody here doesn't have a place to live? Doesn't have a little roof you can get under if it's raining? And, I mean, I'm not asking you if you've got air conditioning. I'm just talking about a place to lay down and rest at night and maybe cook a meal, eat up a meal. It hasn't got to be anything fancy. Are y'all with me this morning? Are y'all asleep? Is all my amen crowd gone on vacation this weekend? Huh? I need somebody to say amen. Are we going to be here a while? Amen. amen. I got some amens in. Bless the Lord. Praise God. I got some amens in. You know what? I think about it and when in our life, God makes it so clear. If I put food in your belly and put clothes on your back, even if you've got to lay down under a pine tree and get a nap, you ain't got no reason to grumble. There's people starving to death all through the world. People don't have clothes to wear. Decent clothes to wear. And, and you've got clothes to wear to keep you warm when it's cold and to, to make you through modestly when it's, when it's warm. And you've got food on your table. You're way ahead of most of the world. Do you know that if you make minimum wage in America... You're in the top, I heard this, top 45% of the world in wealth if you make minimum wage. In other words, 55% of the world doesn't have it that good. We ought to be content. Amen? In other words, when, when somebody walks by us, they ought not see us down, discouraged, frowning, uh, because of some little thing that, that really... <laughs> We don't have to have. You ever get down because of something you don't have to have? Hello? I, I went fishing. I'm down because I went fishing yesterday and I didn't care. Well, bless your little pea picking Southern Baptist heart. Well, why don't you just murmur about that for a while and see where that gets you? Well, my football team lost the football game last night. I am really down about that. What you shaking your head for over there, Mira? <laughs> Mira, Mira, Memphis, Mississippi State. 
her favorite team in all the world. Got ate by the Tigers last night. Love you, Miss Mira. Contentment. Even if your football team don't win. Contentment, number one, has to be learned. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, he said, I, I have learned in whatever estate I'm in, therewith to be content. He said, I learned that. We don't come here. That's not a natural thing. Are you with me? That's not natural because I'm born wanting every toy in the nursery. I want all the other kids not to have a single toy. I want them all. And I want them all in the corner. And if you come over and try to get one of them, I'm going to knock you in the head. And if you ask me, if the, if the person working in the nursery asks me if I knocked you in the head and they just saw me knock you in the head, I'm going to say, no, I ain't touched them. Huh? Because I'm born thinking it's all about me. It's not about you. And if I can get all the toys and I can knock you in the head and get away with it, I'm going to have a good day. That's how we're born. We're born to get ahead. We're born to survive. Survival of the fittest, they say. We're born to try to, to, try to win in life. Contentment has to be learned by an experience with God that says, Hey, wake up, little boy, little girl. It's not all about you. Forget taking all the toys. Share your toys. Don't bop little Johnny upside the head. You know, uh, be kind and give to others. <laughs> That's not natural. Are you with me? That's supernatural. And that needs God's help to do that. Paul said, therefore, I'm, I've had to learn how to do that. I've had to learn it. The second thing under number three is contentment looks to bless others rather than self. No better feeling than to invest in somebody else. I promise you, my friend, listen to me. If you will give to someone else something that they need... God will bless you because you have shown contentment. You have shown God, I could put this in the savings account or I could bless somebody else with it. And God said, bless somebody else. And when you bless somebody else, I promise you, it'll give you a feeling like you've just been godly. You've just done something godly. Sometimes we never feel that. We, never, we feel like we make all the decisions that are selfish and not godly. Not seeking the Lord. And so, materialistic people only care about themselves. They only care about keeping all the toys and doing it all their way. And not thinking about God's way. So, there's instructions, there's things to learn about contentment. But you're going to have to make an effort to learn it. Let me say this to you. And this is about most of the things that we do wrong. God's going to let you keep feeling bad and going to keep letting you do it wrong and keep convicting you until you start doing it right. Do you hear me? There are things that we need to learn that God's going to keep letting it be a problem in our life until we learn to do it right. You're never going to learn the joy of contentment if you don't learn to give and to care about somebody else more than yourself. Care about the kingdom of God more than yourself. Number four in your outline, the intoxication of constantly needing more. Constantly wanting more. Verse 9 talks about that. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare into the foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Two things about it. First of all, it can distract us from what's most important. 
You see, you won't have that kingdom mindset. You won't think about church. You won't think about God. You won't think about helping somebody else. It'll distract you, my friend. It'll become something that becomes so intoxicating to you. It'll be like an addiction to have more. You've all heard me say this, except maybe a few, so I'll say it for them. But the Rockefellers, one of the richest Rockefellers in the world, once was asked what was good, what was enough. And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. I just need a little more. It's intoxicating. It's addicting. Having the things of the world. Because it kind of fills a spot in us that I'm winning. I'm winning in this life. So it distracts us and it can destroy us. He goes on to say there it leads to men in destruction and in perdition. The Scriptures tell us there in verse 9 how important it is if we take our eyes off of God and, and we miss the will of God, if we reject the will of God, then we will find ourselves in the end destroyed. And maybe even in this life destroyed. I read an article one time, it blew my mind. It talked about people who win the lottery. Millions of dollars won in lotteries over the years. Most of them, and I forget the percentage, but it was over half. Most of them are bankrupt in five years. And all the things that they thought would bring them joy and happiness and fulfill their life, they lose it all. Why? Because they got intoxicated on things. And it led them, instead of into being great wealth and learning to give and care and share with others, it led them into the debtor's dungeon of life. And the things of this world don't bring joy. It's what we do with those things. I, I think about, there's a, I looked it up this morning, there's a number of verses. There's some things that at least allude to this over a hundred times in the Bible. It talks about not veering to the left or to the right. For example, when they were moving the, the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, at one time he said, don't go to the left or to the right. Keep your eyes focused on straight ahead. Several times it said, move to the left or to the right. One, one of the verses was Deuteronomy 28, 14. It said, do not turn aside to the left or to the right or any of the, uh, from any of my words that I command you today. Do not go after the other gods. Do not serve them. For that, we know what that leads to, to destruction and judgment in our life. But God tells us time and again, man, keep your focus on God, on the finish line, on how He views things and not how we view things, not how our flesh views things. And don't let that become your motivating force of your life is getting a little more. Number five in your outline, the indoctrination of the Christian mind. Verse 10, we see he talks about that. He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed their faith in greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And he talks about that sadness of that contentment is not an excuse to be passive about sin in your life. The indoctrination of the Christian mind, we can sometimes think, well, I'm content with the sin that I have. I, I, you know, I know I'm not doing things right. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm okay with that, and God's okay with that. No. God never says contentment means that your sin is okay. God never says that contentment means that you can just be passive about spiritual obedience to God. Have you ever justified your sin? Saying things like, well, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing that. No, they're not. Number one, no, they're not. My kids were small. Sometimes they'd say, Daddy, everybody's going to be there. I said, well, bless your heart. Do you want to get in the car and us drive by there and wave to them as we go by? <laughs> well, Daddy, everybody's doing it. Well, son, if everybody's on the bridge jumping off in the river and drowning, are you going to do it too? Is that what you want to do? Tell you what let's do. Let's go up there and stand on the bridge and watch them jump off and wave to them as they go off in the water. But you're not doing it. Because guarantee you one thing, everybody's not doing it because you're not going to do it. <laughs> Hello? Do you mind being part of the 1%? Or do you just have to be part of the 99%? Those are the questions we have to ask our life. 
Contentment is not an excuse to be passive about your sin. Number two, contentment is not an excuse to lack passion about the Scriptures. Hear me now. Contentment is not an excuse to lack passion about the Scriptures. How many of you got up this morning and had to go find your Bible? I'll just sit right here while you think about that. You said, I know it was here somewhere. Honey, where'd you put my Bible last week when we got home from church? Some of you are smugly sitting there right now. Here's what you're saying. He don't know. I got more than one Bible. I don't give a flip. How many Bibles you got? How many did you read this week? You see, sometimes the reason we don't know where it was at this morning because we ain't picked it up all week long. Hello? Where's your Bible hid? I'm just going to sit right here and let that sink in for just a moment. Hmm. Bible. Is he saying we're supposed to read that thing during the week? Is he implying that we need to read it during the week? Remember that Bible verse that we read? And this is a word from heaven now, it's coming down. Psalm 119, 11. Hmm. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God Hmm. let's get out of commentary and see what that means that means read my Bible memorize some of the things I read in my Bible to put it in my heart hide it in my heart is that what you're saying yeah okay hide it in my heart that I might not sin well God is it sin if I'm contented is it sin if I'm okay with, <laughs> with my sin? <laughs> I'm under grace. <sighs> yeah, I get your point. Read my Bible. Learn from it. Live by it. But God, I'm so contented. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Decide whether or not these are words of life or not. Are they words of life? We did the scripture memorization. I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I got to say something about it. Whole church. Whole church. Twelve verses. Twelve verses. Just one a month. Just remember one a month. Steak dinner. Nice steak dinner. We have four in the whole church. Memorize their verses. Four! Let's see. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it's about 1%, 2%. Memorize our verses. And I know some of you are saying, I'm too old to memorize. You got recipes memorized from 40 years ago. You still remember them recipes. You know exactly how much salt to put in it and how much pepper to put in it. And you got all that memorized, you know. But, and, 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 but sometimes that's not important to us. And I'm not pushing Scripture memory, even though it's a good thing and even though God recommended it and even though it'll help you be less... Uh, 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 materialistic but but it's a good thing hide those words in your heart that you might not sin against God how important that is and so and our time is about gone I need to quit so let me finish this last one number six the inspiration of Paul was clear 
In verses 11 and 12, he gives us three things. He says, flee the love of money. Flee the love of money. Loving it, he's saying. He didn't say flee money. He says flee the love of it. Second thing, he says, focus on better things. How did he say it? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. That's the better things. And thirdly, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. It's not going to be easy. Sometimes we have to fight with ourselves, don't we? we? He says, lay hold of eternal life. In other words, let that be your focus. Man, don't be greedy for money and the things of the world. Man, be hungry for the things of God. And don't let the motivating, driving force of your life be what I can do to get ahead and get a little more in life. Because I'm here to tell you, if you're greedy for money, there will be other things that, get, uh, that are better that get left out of your life. And there are several of you probably right here today who could stand up here and testify and say, I'm here to tell you when I was in love with money, there were better things that I let go by the wayside. And nothing wrong with having a good job. Nothing wrong with working hard to provide a good living for your family. Nothing wrong with that. But don't let that become the driving force of your life. Don't that, let that become more important than anything else. Or you will live to regret it. I promise you. Standing behind this pulpit, holding my hands on the Word of God this morning, if you love money, and that's a driving force in your life, you will live to regret some of the choices that you make in this life. Now, Chuck Swindoll has a book called Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. I'll leave you with this thought. Don't be satisfied with less than God's best. How many of you went through school and said, if I can just make a C or a D and get out of here, I'm happy with that? Huh? Well, that may be okay for school, but that's not okay for God. That's not okay for your faith. That's not okay for your spiritual walk with God. God, I don't want to be, I don't want to be exceptional. I don't, I don't want to love eternity. I don't want to love you, God, more. I don't want to give. I want to be greedy. I want it all for myself, and it's all about me. You've missed the whole point of a born-again experience with God if it's all about you. Rick Warren, in his little book, being a purpose-driven church or purpose-driven life, whether you like Rick Warren or like everything in his books, one with it, it begins with this. It's not all about you. It's about God. It starts with that sentence. We need to understand that. A purpose-driven life understands that it's about God not about you and you can be content with less but don't just get by with less be full of joy with whatever God puts your, in your life be thankful be filled with gratitude don't murmur and complain because you don't have this, and you saw somebody else that has it, and you wish you had. You know, you ever see somebody come driving up in a new car, and you say, well, I see where all the money's at now. You know what you're saying? You're saying, I wish I had his car, and he had a feather up his nose. That's what you're saying, and that's coveting. And that meets the top ten list. It's all about God. 
and being satisfied with Him and a little food and a little clothes. And man, if you got a place to live, <laughs> you ought to be tickled to death. But you can't have that if you don't come to God first. And that's what this invitation is about. Brother Whalen, y'all come on and take the instruments in place. It's 12 o'clock. I don't know if y'all have enjoyed listening. I've enjoyed preaching this morning. Katie got her nap in. Bless her heart. It starts with God. Do you have that part right? If you don't have that part right, you're not going to get any of it right. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this invitation, now's the time, God, you can save those that are lost. You can change the attitudes of those that are saved. And God, you can renew and, and bring us to that place of repentance, Lord, and draw us close to you. And, and God, today, you know, you could, you could call somebody to move from one church to this church if that's what you're doing, God. And, and Lord, you just perform what you want to do right now is all we want. God, if there's someone here that's not saved today, give them the courage to walk out of that pew and come up here and take me by the hand, O oh Lord, and, and ask for Jesus to come into their heart. Oh God, have your way today is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand, sing with us on this song, and as if you need to come and be saved, come on today. Don't wait on somebody else, you come. To draw closer to you, Lord. That's why I'll be willing to do for whatever. I'll be willing to do I'll trade sunshine for rain Comfort for pain Good message That's why Good message in song I'll right now Are you willing to do, do that? For whatever it takes For my will to break That's why I'll be willing to do For whatever it takes To draw closer That's what I'll be willing to do For whatever it takes To be more like you That's what I'll be I'll trade sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do for whatever it takes for my. That's what I'll be willing to do. Hey, in closure this morning, I want to say to all of you, remember this. You know, I've seen, I've seen young people go to college, get one or two degrees in college, get out of college, surrender to be missionaries, and go to other countries go to other countries to maybe teach school or kind of do some secretive things there, serving as kind of missionaries in those countries, but they have jobs, and just could have taken their education and gotten good-paying jobs here, 
But they've gone to other countries. They've sacrificed it all to give to God. And, to, and many of them are secretive. You don't know where they are. You don't know that they're missionaries. But there are people all around the world that are teaching English in schools, medical field. And they've given up so much to serve the Lord. I think we all need to learn to give up a little something for God. Amen? I'm so thankful for folks that are willing to do that. And I thought about that. That's such a great example of contentment with what you have. And not just needing to have more and more and more. Amen? Brother Ed, dismiss us, please, sir.